Hey, good morning, Central family. Welcome. And I want to invite you to stand on your feet this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of worship. We want to prepare our hearts for the amazing things that the Lord is going to do in this place this morning. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. Hey. Oh, it goes like this. I saw Satan fall like lightning. Hey. I saw darkness run for cover. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. And I believe. Signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Come on, do you believe that? It's my praise belongs to Him forever. sons and daughters walk with blood and washed in water come on sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started yes our god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life His grace we of my story, so I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Hey. Come on, let's testify and let's declare this together this morning. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. So I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony. From death to life. His grace rewrote my story. So I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, you 
believe that this morning, church. Oh, this is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. Oh, this is our God, and this is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross. I failed to store away and sometimes it's because you just choose to hold the ring but one thing I am sure of the part that doesn't change you are faithful all the same and sometimes there's a trial because I've wandered far away Sometimes it's because you just want to build my faith. But this is my assurance that whatever comes my way, you are faithful all the same. Let's declare this together. And I know.
Sometimes I'm in a storm Cause I've chosen my own way Sometimes it's because you want to have me walk the waves When I know for certain There's truth that still remains You are faithful all the same week we celebrated Easter and the risen King. But God, this morning we pray that we may not just let that be a one day thing, let that be a, a special once a year celebration, but may, may we live that out, God, every single day and celebrate our risen King and Savior. And let that influence everything that we do and every single step that we take in life. May it be influenced by the fact that we have a God who is alive. Do not let us become numb to your word or to your presence or to the fact that we serve the living God. I pray that that may influence us to continue to go out there into the world and make disciples of all nations and spread the good news that you are alive and you are the God of delivering. We pray all these things in your mighty name, Lord. Amen and amen.
Well, welcome, welcome. If you're standing, please take a seat. Uh, we have a few announcements for you. My name is Marcus. This is my friend Ethan. What's going and on? Hey, if you're online and you're standing too, feel free to take a seat. We're so glad you're worshiping with us. And also, if you're a guest in the room, thanks for coming back. Easter was last week. It was a big week. But we know some of you came back today. So if you haven't identified as new yet, we have a new here, big banner in the lobby. Or you can come see me at the info desk. I'll help you out as well. We're so thankful that you're here. Or if you're just a guest in general, welcome, welcome, welcome. So happy to see you. Ethan, we have some announcements today. Yeah, we do. That's Marcus. My name is Ethan. I'm the young adult pastor here at Central. If you're a young adult, out of high school, not married, uh, still in your 20s. We are having a young adult gathering right here at Central Thursday night. Thursday night. I'd love to talk with you if I haven't met you already. If you're looking for a way to get plugged in, maybe you are looking for a group, maybe you're looking for just different events going on, maybe you just need a pastor to talk to, you can text Central Holland to 94000. You'll talk to this guy right here. It'll give you eight different prompts. He'll send you to, you know, he'll, he'll get you connected wherever you need to go. You can also scan the QR code, the Central Happenings QR code. It'll take you to our webpage that has everything going on at Central. And we're going to highlight a couple of those things. Marcus, what do we got going on? Yes, so the QR code in your pew, it's a bulletin. But know that we're going to highlight just the ones coming up soon, all right? Big events. So April 21st, the baptism. That's in two yep. weeks. All right, if you're interested in that or you want to learn more or you're ministering to someone who could ready to take that next step of baptism, we have a meeting after service today right in the Legacy Room. But just know, April 21st, you want to celebrate with us, we'll have the, the baptismal right here in the front, and we love those times of hearing testimonies and worshiping and celebrating what God is doing in people's lives. Another one coming up, this one's important if you have children. April 14th, sign up, kicks off for the summer camps. Now, that's not summer camp like at Geneva. That's right here in the building. There's sewing, painting, AV. There's 16 different camps all happening this summer, but there is space limited in each of them. So sign up is starting next Sunday, uh, bright and early in the morning. So you'll want to hop on that if you want to get your kids signed up April 14th. We have one more, Ethan. What is it? Yeah, so we're really excited about this one. April 19th, that's a Friday, two Fridays. We're gonna have the Water's Edge Worship Night, our very own Water's Edge Worship Team at the Water's Edge Coffee Shop in South Haven, I almost said North Haven, South Haven. Uh, April 19th, tickets are on sale. You can uh, find those tickets by scanning the QR code in the pew in front of you. They are selling fast, y'all. If you are interested in being there, we, we want Central to have a presence there. Uh, so tickets are going fast. Scan the QR code. Check out what's going on. Yeah, it is in a coffee shop, so think about that for a second. Yeah. Um, last thing I'm going to say, if you're a part of our family here, we do talk about his ties, our offerings. There's three ways to give. They're on the screen behind me, which you can mail in, you can hand in, or you can just sign up online. But those are just ways that we worship the Lord. Giving is one of those. Other ways we worship is in song with praise. So if you want to stand back it up, we are going to lift up the Almighty in one more song. So join us in singing. Oh 
sing this out together. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. Thanks, Jeremy. Well, good morning, everybody. Man, you look fantastic. So glad that you're here. So glad that you've joined us. Maybe you came last week for the first time on Easter, and you're back again. We're especially glad to have you. Or if this is your first time in a little while or first time ever, uh, we're so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning and glad to have you. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, we're here today to continue a story that we heard last week. In the ancient church... The, the Easter story was not confined to one Sunday. In fact, it was such a big story that they created a season called Easter. And so multiple Sundays, this is often called the second Sunday of Easter. And I'd like to talk about one particular angle on that story in just a moment. But I'm uniquely qualified to give it because I have witnessed a resurrection. Let me explain. A few years ago, Ann and I rescued a dog, a big German shepherd, and we brought him into our home, and we had a fenced-in yard, and we kept him there. And they said, one of the things they told us, they said, we don't think he's good with cats. And we didn't have a cat, so we were fine. The yard is completely fenced in. In fact, I made sure that it was really protected because I didn't want one to wander into our yard in case he really wasn't good with cats. One day... And figure what happened. We were sitting on the back porch. The dog was with us, and all of a sudden, he got up and tore into the corner. Sure enough, a cat had wandered into our yard. Now, this has a happy ending. <laughs> but the last thing I saw as I'm trying to fly around and catch up to him was he had the cat in his mouth, okay? And I thought in an instant, this is going to be terrible. And I got there, and the cat was already dead, laid right out. Again, it has a happy ending. Um, <laughs> stay with me. The cat's lifeless body is there, dirt, you know, a little saliva. Dog, I got the dog away, of course. And uh, I was so mortified, and then I noticed it had a collar. 
with a phone number. So I knew I was going to have to make a terrible phone call. So I called it. My neighbor picked up. And, and it was not her cat, it was her kid's cat. And she said, I know. <laughs> she said, I'll send them right over. I'm like, oh. So I found a little cardboard box and I carefully laid the cat in the box, completely lifeless. And I, I was like, Ann, I don't, we're just going to have to do whatever we can, help them, maybe get it, you know, whatever. Your mind is just confused, right? Racing. So I'm walking, a picture of us walking across the yard to each other. They're coming. I could already see tears. They're coming towards me. I have the cat in the box. And I don't know if they said something. I can't remember. But all of a sudden, the cat leaped out of the box, <laughs> went tearing to their garage, and we both stood there with our mouths open going, I, I was sure he was dead. And I asked our na my neighbor, Rachel, I said, how's he doing? You know, a couple days later, she said, well, he doesn't want to go outside right now. <laughs> like, you know, the story of Easter is so significant because the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, if you've never heard anything else here, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the single most important event that has happened in human history. It's the reason you're here today. It was the witnesses to that event. It was those that were confused about Jesus' teaching throughout his time on earth and, and oftentimes failing along the way, but it was the fact that they witnessed Jesus die and then saw him alive again. That turned a bunch of scared and insecure followers of his into the boldest missionary force that the world has ever known. And they took the message of Jesus into all the world. They became his witnesses. They even said that about themselves. We are witnesses of this. And that's what emboldened the church. So Easter would never be one big Sunday for them, and then it'd just be kind of a letdown, like it is for some of us sometimes, you know. Confessions in the church world, we build up and build up and build up for Easter. We spend a lot of time. We really want you to bring guests, and we want it to be a big event. And then the week after Easter is always sort of this little letdown, a little, a little bit of a less energy just from the standpoint of getting prepared because we're so up. And we've all experienced that, right? We've all experienced mountaintops. And then we come to a time where it's, it's kind of a valley again and we're just kind of going about our everyday lives. And Easter's sort of that way for us in this generation in our time where we had the experience, we, we sang all the songs, we celebrated again. Some of you made first-time commitments. It, it was an awesome high point. But then life gets busy, and we turn back to sometimes our, our sad world, and it, 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 it seems like Easter was just some little interruption into this really busy, crazy life that we have. Author Philip Yancey says that there's two ways to look at human history, he decided. One is to take all the wars and the pandemics and the sadness and the sickness and then Easter is just this little interruption in an otherwise sort of chaotic world. But he said, what if? What if we take Easter as the starting point, as the ultimate sign of how God loves you and loves this world? What if that's our starting point? Then hope flows like lava beneath the crust of everyday life. Love that. You know, some of you, I, I remember hearing a preacher a few years ago, I think it's been in preacher circles for years, but there was this line, I, I think it was at a wedding, he said, remember, moonlight and roses always turns into daylight and dishes. <laughs> Have you heard that before? Oh, good. Daylight and dishes, right? That's what we're left with so often when, after the, the high points, we're back to the everyday mundane. Well, maybe make this real for you. Some of you, maybe, maybe your team won the National College Football Championship last fall, and you were right, way high, and you've been wearing a sweatshirt. I've seen it. But then your coach left. You know, most of your offense is gone, and you're right back to daylight and dishes. And, and to compound that, your in-state rival's on the rise, and yeah, back to, back to daylight and dishes. Yeah. Some of you just got back from spring break. We're so happy for you. And um, 
we just want you to know that today is the nicest day that we've had since you left. <laughs> but you're back from a high point. Remember how excited you were to leave town? Daylight and dishes today. But one of the things that we can remind ourselves of in the story of Easter is it didn't just end with that event. There was this ongoing presence of Jesus in the everyday. And the disciples were trying to begin to make sense of all of that. Today we're going to look at a story. I love that Luke captured it. He was the only of the gospel writers that captured it. It's the story of the road to Emmaus. It's in Luke chapter 24. You can get ready to get there, but we're going to pray first and get ready to just kind of go through that story. It's a story of two travelers that instead of the angels all in gleaming white and the burst of light at the tomb, it's just two people walking along a road and Jesus joins them. They don't recognize him. I'm glad that, that Luke captured it because one commentator says, it's the story for every Christ follower. This story is a story for every Christ follower. We can find ourselves in the story. And maybe as we head into the week ahead with daylight and dishes, we can, we can begin to put ourselves in different aspects of this story so that we can learn what it means to experience the resurrection in a fresh way. Would you join me in praying and then we'll open the scriptures together. Well, Heavenly Father, here we are, the week after the day we celebrated your resurrection. But it goes on and on. And already this morning, as we've sensed your presence in our worship, as we've reminded ourselves of the way your ministry is moving through this church and through the generosity of people, we, we praise you for that. We praise you for the resurrection victory of, East, of Easter. Now open our hearts I pray, open our hearts and our minds to grasp the wonder of that one glorious day and how it comes back to us every day when you overcame death itself and ushered in a new way of life. Empower us, we pray, to go from here to not only have our hearts warmed, but also that we could tell others. Give us the hearts to do what you command to be witnesses to your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for today's scripture, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. If you have a Bible, certainly read along, but I'm purposely not going to put it on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you because, you know, one of the ancient traditions of the church was the public reading of scripture. In fact, Apostle Paul wrote to one of his mentees, Timothy, and he said, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and to teaching. And so I'd like to just read the story. I'd like you to use your imagination. If it helps you to close your eyes, if, it, if, it's, if it's something that you can just engage with your hearts and minds, turn off your distraction for a moment, I would love for you to just hear the story as Luke put it down. Here it is. Now the same day, this is the same day as the resurrection day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And so he asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but did not find his body. 
They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they, they did not see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now as they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke the bread and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with him assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them by the breaking of bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, three observations from this passage. One, it's a story of an Easter journey. Two, it's a story of an Easter meal. And three, it's a story of Easter hope. So first, let's talk about the journey. So two disciples start off for Emmaus. One, we find out, has a name. and He's called Cleopas. The other one is anonymous, and scholars on Luke believe that Luke did that intentionally so that we could place our name into that slot. It says Jesus came up and walked alongside them, but they were kept from recognizing him. You know, it's a common theme in the stories of what happened on that Easter morning and as Jesus began to interact with his disciples after the resurrection, people simply didn't recognize him. He was there, but they didn't recognize him. It points out to perhaps the most amazing revelation of Easter that Jesus is alive in body, but it's different. It's clearly a new body. It's flesh and bones. It even includes scars. Yet it's not limited by the physical world. He's ushering in the new creation. He's given a glimpse of what the new creation looks like. It's a new world. It's here. It's on this earth. It's a new creation. In Revelation, Jesus would say, Behold, I am making all things new. It's the first glimpse that these disciples would have of this new new creation. So put yourself in the story. Here's the first challenge for us. Perhaps we need to recognize the possibility of seeing Christ in every stranger we meet. Jesus is walking along not recognizable. He's a stranger, gets right in the middle and asks them what they're talking about. Seems a little forward, thank you very much. Luke writes that the question stopped them in their tracks. Remember it said they stood still. They were walking, and as soon as he asked what they were talking about, they stood still. Their face is downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who did not know these things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus, of course, doesn't, take anything to heart there. He just all of a sudden turns it into a question. One of the things you'll find about Jesus through all the scriptures is he asks really good questions. So he said, what things? He asked. Did you ever notice how open-ended questions are his specialty? Open-ended questions allow a person's heart to be revealed. It works with everybody but your teenagers. But the who's and the what's and how's, those are the things that Jesus was really special at, trying to get to people's hearts. Trauma counselors teach that when ministering in trauma, as soon as people are able, urge them to talk about how they're feeling. Ask about feelings, angry, sad, confused, questions like, what's the worst thing in all of this for you? The more they can talk, it will, it will decrease the intensity of their emotion. Well, they answered in verse 19. It's about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. 
The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. I love that line in the middle of this. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's been the third day since all this took place. Notice how the, his question revealed their heart when they got to that line. We had hoped. That's where the discouragement, that's where the downcast had come from. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. I don't know about you, but losing hope is a condition of this world. Disappointment and discouragement is something that we all carry with us at various levels. Sometimes we open our newspaper or turn, turn the news on and we're disappointed in our politics or we're disappointed in other people or we even look in the mirror and we're disappointed with ourselves. Jesus wants to give us space to open up to him about that. And so maybe another place you can enter the story is here. If you're facing discouragement, if there's a loss of hope in your life right now, it starts with Jesus asking you, what things? Maybe your place is to just share with him. He'd like to know about it. He's asking you today, what things? Today, I hope you will. That's what prayer is. It's just pouring out to God. Sometimes it helps to write things out, all the things that are troubling you. Tell him. Well, then Jesus takes them all the way back to Moses and all the prophets, explaining what Scripture had to say about himself. Maybe the first thing we need when we lose hope is the perspective. And Jesus' first step is to take them back to the Scriptures and the story so that their perspective can grow is that Jesus' life and ministry, death and resurrection was foretold from the beginning. Like my friends with the Bible Project remind us, the Bible is one unified story that points to Jesus. One commentator puts it like this. He teaches them that the news the woman told, women told them should not be surprising. Remember, that was just this morning that the women came and shared with the group. They echo what the angels told the women at the tomb. Remember how he told you that the Son of Man would have, to, would, have to be, would have to die, be crucified, and on the third day would raise again? That's what they reported back to the, to, to the disciples. The repetition and the reminder of what they were taught may cause us to wonder how they could forget so quickly. But we can all relate. When we have trouble believing something, when our hearts are heavy, we often have to be told again, and again, the repetition in the story of Easter is for us. So maybe you could enter into this thought. Maybe you find some comfort and healing that those closest to Jesus face challenges in keeping their hope alive, just as we do. But to grow to love God's word, Jesus brought the scriptures alive to help them gain perspective. And what if he still does that? Sometimes you might have an experience where a verse, one sing, single verse will come to mind in the course of your life. And, and I really believe that that's the reason that we want to have you reading your Bibles and opening your Bibles. And I urge you to consider a step this week. Find a Bible, and if you need one, we'll get you one. Go out to our information desk. Read a, ver a few verses and then ask. I, I got this from Tim Keller, one of my all-time favorite authors. But he said, read a verse and ask two questions. How would I be different if this truth was, were alive in my inmost being? That's the first question. How would I be different if this truth were in my inmost being? And, or, God, why are you showing me this today? First question, how would I be different if this truth were alive in my inmost being? And God, why are you showing me this today? In fact, if you want to start something really simple, say you're not a reader or you don't want to start another program or you've got so many unfinished devotionals on your phone, one way you could start is to simply take the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, first verse. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. How would I be different if this truth were alive in my inmost being? Our Father who art in heaven. God, why are you showing me this today? Do, do I need to know that it's our Father? That I'm not alone? In heaven, 
Is it because you want to remind me that you are the all-powerful God, a God that we can trust? Our Father who art in heaven. Start somewhere. There's so many different ways. And one thing I'd encourage is, is also get a, get, a, get a paper Bible. I know it's so easy. I have the Bible on my phone too and I look it up all the time. But here's one thing you don't get with an electronic Bible. You don't get a chance to write notes. Now some of you maybe were brought up that you never write into the sacred scriptures, but I do all the time. And, you know, when we sometimes as pastors get asked to do a funeral, one of the most holy moments we have is when they say, here's our loved one's Bible. And we get to page through the different scriptures and they'll have the names of their kids or their grandkids or they'll, they'll, circle, they'll circle and put a date and then there'll be a date 10 years later for a certain verse. Wouldn't that be some legacy? I have a friend um, that when his kids were seniors in high school, he would, start a, he would buy a brand new Bible at the start of the year. And then every day as he did his devotions, he would always pull that Bible out in addition to his other, and he would write notes to that particular child about things that he had read or insights that he had. And then he gave it to them as they left home. But whatever you do, we really encourage you. We talk about Bible reading not because we want something from you. We want it for you. It's something that will open your life. It'll give you perspective. Well, that leads us to the, to the Easter meal. After Jesus opened the scripture to these two discouraged people, they, they invited him in. After the conversation, the story of the two travelers that they invite, they actually urge him strongly to come and stay with them. I love what it tells us about hospitality. You know, it's one of those things that we as Christians, it's part of our makeup is to be hospitable. And welcoming people here at this, at, at this event or at these worship services are so important. But we want hospitality to per permeate every one of your lives. It's hard for me as an introvert. I like to have my circle small. But we have really been trying to stretch ourselves to include other people into our lives and our hearts. And I wonder if your connection to the story today is the hospitality exp expressed by these two disciples. They urged him to come and stay with them. A stranger. Perhaps that part of the story is for you. Consider where your heart is regarding hospitality. You might say, of course I'd invite Jesus in. They didn't know it was Jesus. Is there a step in the direction that the Lord wants you to take? Maybe like you, I sometimes feel pressure to share Jesus with my friends and neighbors. How about this? With summer coming, how about we pick up the old mantra, barbecue first. Invite friends over. Just invite them for a no-pressure meal. Just get to know them. Maybe you could pray. And pray and pray for the food and say, hey, we, we make a habit of, of just asking to give thanks to the Lord and to ask in his blessing. We'd like to pray for you, too. Nobody refuses that. Well, back to our story. They said, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day's almost over. And then he finally, Jesus reveals himself. It says he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and began to give it them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Do you remember how long ago it was that they first saw that Jesus do this? What, three, four days? Maybe four days, right? The Last Supper, what we know as, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Now, I love this painting. I've been kind of on a kick of 1,500 Italian artists, okay? Um, largely because my wife and I went to Italy a few years ago, and art is everywhere there. And as we were talking to one of the guides, the, the, they told us that one of the reasons for these depictions of Bible stories was that the population was mostly illiterate. So they would go to these artists, and they would say, take this story, and, and you create it. You show us. And then they commissioned these art pieces and they put them in churches and cathedrals all over northern Italy. This was by a guy named Carvaggio. And if you were in the chapel a few weeks ago, I showed a different picture, so I'm on this kick right now. But this is actually titled Supper at Emmaus. And I love how he depicted this. If you look a little closer, they just realized, you see, one of the things he says is the, the, the disciples jumped up. By the way, the standing guy is apparently the attendant for the meal. The disciples see it in the breaking of the bread, and they, he's got their eyes. I would never pick this up, but I read about it. Their eyes are focused on his hands because it was his hands 
not only they took bread, but they could then see the scars. They're not, it's not clear in that picture, but that's what they were saying. The Lord's Supper is our resurrection meal. We should always treat it with reverence. It should be something, that's why when we take communion here, we, we want it to be something that is highly reverent for us. It was because they had offered hospitality, though they couldn't see Jesus in the opening of the scriptures, they now saw him in the breaking of the bread. I was thinking about the Lord's Supper. I thought, what a great segue. We should have communion today. And I think there's, there's probably some compelling reasons for that, but I, I started thinking about something else with this. Uh, I like what author Richard Rohr imagines Luke responding to this question. By the way, this was written several decades after the life of Jesus. Between 60 and 80 AD, Jesus, you know, around 33, 30, 30 33 is when he was, he was crucified. Luke responds. He says, okay, Luke, it's year 80 already. We don't see Jesus anymore. How is he present to us? And Luke would say he's present in the Eucharist. We know him in this celebration. We can't sit down at the table like the first disciples did. I can't do that myself. But we can sit at a new table in our town and experience the Lord's Supper just as they did and know him just as they did and our hearts will burn within us. Luke uses the phrase here, and their eyes were open. N.T. Wright says, do you recall another scene in the Bible where somebody ate something and their eyes were open? Go all the way back to the first few pages of the Bible. Remember Adam and Eve, they took fruit, it was pleasing to the eye, and they ate it, and it says their eyes were open. And what happened next? They were filled with shame. They were banished. They came face to face with sin. Here's the first meal recorded in the new creation. Their eyes are opened and they begin to experience the hope and the joy and the promise. Things are being redeemed, coming full circle. That's part of the amazing subplot of Easter, that a new creation is beginning. Jesus is the same, same, same in some ways, but different. Heaven has come to earth, and Jesus is embodying that. That's why we keep talking about Jesus. That's what enlivened the early church. That's why we can't help but ask you, have you known him? Can you know him? Can we help you find him? Well, I thought about communion this week, but I thought maybe an even better thing for us to do is to consider meals and prepare ourselves maybe through the, the regular habits of our lives so that the next time we receive communion, we can be fully engaged and prepared. Perhaps today, consider the common bond that we share with others every time that we sit down and break bread, have a meal together. I was thinking about special meals at our house over the Easter week, and we had two meals that we had all of our kids together with spouses, and uh, we had... We always have such a great time, and inevitably, Anne will always say, I love when we're all together. And it is, there's something about a community meal, and I know in the rush and the bustle of, of everyday life, sometimes that's hard, but maybe, maybe a challenge for you this week is to consider a meal. Make it. Enjoy it with some friends, or enjoy it with your, the people you live with. One of the challenges we have as empty nesters is we often graze for dinner. And I said to Anne, we have to have at least one meal a week where we sit down, we actually talk to each other, and we don't just rush through it. Otherwise, we're going to board up the kitchen and just put in vending machines. <laughs> I know many of you have everyone together often. And I would just encourage you, maybe your part of the story is to consider how a meal might, might lead the way to something bigger for you. Well, finally, we've talked about the journey, we've talked about the meal, now we're going to talk about Easter hope. One of the great lines in this passage is, we're not our hearts burning within us when he opened the scriptures. When you're near Jesus, your heart will change. He loves you so much to leave you where you are. Not only will it be for your good and his glory, but it will be good for the world. 
Wouldn't it be something if instead of welcoming people to Central Wesleyan Church, the 9 o'clock service, he said, welcome to the fellowship of the burning hearts. In the resurrection story, there's this final step, which is there's a consistent theme of going and telling, going and telling. They, or they went on their own and went back and told. With hearts on fire, these two return back to Jerusalem to go and tell the others, just as the women had returned earlier in the day to tell them. In the end, the apostles were transformed by the reality of the new creation. And they couldn't stop talking about it. They were transformed from scared and hopeless to bold and fearless. The resurrection of Jesus meant that God's plan was moving forward. His kingdom is coming, and they went out to proclaim about themselves, we are witnesses. Maybe your part of the story is to reclaim the joy that you might have once felt about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. The resurrection didn't need anything us, from us to prove it. All it needs now is, wit, is a witness. Will you be a witness to what you have seen and heard on Easter? The story of the new creation, the most incredible thing that has ever happened. Will you testify to the point to and point to the great victory that has occurred at the empty tomb? There are people out there, sometimes people in here, who are dying to hear the news. Will you be a witness? Let's pray together. Just a moment, our team is going to come up and we're going to be reminded again of what it means to give up our agenda in order to put God in the center and to make him glory, glorified. So Father, I pray in this moment that for all of my friends, we would find our place in this story. Would you help us Recognize strangers. Would you help us open our hearts and our homes? Would you help us to understand your presence in our Lord's Supper? Father, would you help us to open scriptures so that we might understand you better and the perspective that you give us of this unified, amazing story? We love you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, will you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning?
Hey, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and thank you so much for being here and worshiping with us. I want to invite you next week to come back as we begin our new series, We Pray It Forward, right here at 9 and 1045. We'll see you next week. Have a blessed day.